Welcome back, fantastic friends and fans, to the 14th episode of the Fancast at Four podcast. My name is Dan Bettenhausen, and I'm your host as we venture into the what-ifs of Marvel's first family. We'll be appearing in Phase 6 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. While it has recently been announced that Matt Shackman will be helming the MCU's version of the Fantastic Four, we still think it'd be fun and interesting to explore what it would be like if a different director was behind the camera, and who might they cast. If you are new to the podcast and want to hear a brief history of the Fantastic Four, you can check out our first episode where guest Pat Bolfamonte of the Montiverse provides a breakdown of each of the characters. Now, let's dive in and meet this episode's guest and see what they have in store for us. For this episode, we are lucky to have Jack Mayer returning to the podcast. Jack had previously joined us for the M. Night Shyamalan and Tom Hooper episodes. Jack, welcome back. Every time I think I'm out, they pull me right back in. I am so happy to be back. I'm glad. I'm I glad. love doing this show, as you know. This is, it makes me happy. We, I think I've done one, like, at this point, I think I'm going on a monthly raid. It's the yeah, highlight almost, of my month. Yeah, close. I, well, hey, I appreciate <laughs> that. I mean, you are someone I am always glad to have back. I mean, hey, don't get me wrong. All of my guests have been great, but there's a reason you've returned. Mostly because you're willing to do the weird stuff, <laughs> the weird stuff, the weird directors, I, I, the weird shows. <laughs> my niche. I love. I love the weird stuff. I love the outlandish ideas. So, and you know, we are doing something a little different this time. Um, but you know what? I'm going to go on a tangent because I learned something about you today. I feel like this is my show. We can talk about whatever the hell we want. I know it wasn't a first time watch, but you logged the film Mamma Mia for the first time on Letterboxd recently. I did, and I gave it five stars because that's what that movie deserves. I, I might need to re reassess. I have it at four stars, but my unabashed love for ABBA music, you're learning something about me, listeners. I love ABBA music. Uh, really propelled that movie into the stratosphere. So, Jack, what about ABBA? And again, this has nothing to do with the rest of the episode, listeners, but I, I have Jack here. He loves the movie. I love the movie. We're going to talk about Mamma Mia. Yeah. So what what about the movie really uh, hits your taste? Well, I don't know if you could tell from my uh, musical that I wrote in the Tom <laughs> Hooper episode, but I'm a pretty big fan of musicals. Uh, yeah. And it's weird. I typically don't like jukebox musicals. And Mamma Mia is that, for those who don't know, a jukebox musical is a musical that has its own original story, but uses the music of another artist for its music and lyrics right. in order to propel that story forward. And Mamma Mia is probably the most successful jukebox musical, I'd say. I'd uh, say been so. on Broadway for 10 years, I think. Right, right. I think another one, like Rock of Ages is up there. Movie is garbage, but I, I did enjoy the show enough. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I Jersey I Boys ran for a while. Uh, also Boys a garbage movie. Yeah, garbage movie, great show. I love I love the stage production. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, movie bad, very bad. Uh, but Mamma Mia, the movie is excellent <laughs> because it understands the spirit of what the show is. As the kids say, it understood the assignment. It really did. <laughs> uh, I will also say uh, I watched that movie last night with uh, two of my roommates at college. Uh, for some context. They are both straight. I am not. We are all <laughs> film majors. It was like a social experiment. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I probably should have learned that I was bi a lot sooner than I was, <laughs> knowing that I love this movie. But you know what? <laughs> to each their own. In everyone's due time. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You... you... <laughs> <laughs> Figure out your love for Mama Mia in your own due time. We are we are here for you. We are accepting in this Mama Mia community. <laughs> um, the LGBTQMM plus. Right. <laughs> so I think ABBA stands for All Bi Boys Accepted. That's yes, actually what it exactly. stands for. Yeah. So, you know, I fit right in. <laughs> we're already starting listeners so we've already uh, gone yeah. off the rails they've they've already clicked away we're losing a damn bring it back in so okay a few more things about mama mia then we will get into what we're here to talk about where are you on pierce brosnan as a singer 
he sucks. He's a terrible <laughs> singer, and I love it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I, unlike unlike a movie we both pan, Les Mis, where Russell Crowe is bad and he deserves to be bad, and we hate it. Pierce Brosnan is kind of the opposite. He's bad, but we love it. Well, here's the thing about like Mamma Mia. You don't need to be a good singer to have fun singing Ava. Right. And that's what Pierce Brosnan is doing. He is having a ball singing those songs. The he thing is, is not many of them art into it. Not many of them are great singers in the movie. You know, I mean, so, with some exception, but I'd I say... I would contest that Amanda Seyfried and Christian Bransky are the only good ones. Agreed. Agreed. 100%. But again, I, it's it's ABBA music. Uh, do you have a favorite ABBA song? Whether it's from give the me, show... Gimme, gimme, gimme. Is that show-related or just in general? Both. Both. Okay. I think my favorite is probably Take a Chance on Me in the movie, but Waterloo is my favorite just ABBA song. Waterloo is so good. Um, I, will, I do like the second one, Here We Go Again. Didn't love the Waterloo performance in it, though, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So that's, I I think, where my that. an, that's where my answer is shaped some. But anyway, we went on our ABBA tangent. If you love ABBA music, say so in the comments. If you don't, Shut up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, let's let's uh, right the ship, as as they say. Um, for this episode, I am actually very excited uh, because we we are mixing things up a little bit. Rather than discussing a potential Fantastic Four film, we are going to be exploring what if it were a TV show. As for the showrunner being show, a TV show. As for the showrunner being featured. Uh, he is an American television producer, writer, director, and actor. His comedies typically include large, diverse casts and have created stars themselves. His show features optimistic characters who often find strong friendships and lasting love through plots that showcase good-hearted humanistic warmth. He has been nominated for 23 Emmy Awards, winning two for his work on Saturday Night Live and The Office. This week, we are featuring the one and only Mike Shore. Jack, when you hear the name Mike Shore, what comes to mind? Outside of all the stuff I literally just said. <laughs> uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, wow, this guy is smart. Right. He knows like, how to write comedy. But not just comedy. He knows how to write intelligent, thought-provoking television that just happens to be really funny. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, and he's a he's a funny actor. Like from from the office, him playing Moe's, like though he's not featured a ton, he's just kind of a bit side character. Mm -hmm. Very funny in that role. And it's so great when you see someone who has that writing background and is put in his dues writing, then producing, and then finally getting a few shows we're gonna talk about that he created and show ran. Like this guy really worked his way to the success he has earned today. Absolutely. So I think we're going to have some pretty good conversations about some of those shows he's been a part of, he's produced, and he's, co he's show ran. Uh, so I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. So let's get into that segment we call, we used to call Four Fantastic Films, but now we're calling Four Fantastic Shows. And let's lead off with the show he's probably uh, originally known for. He wasn't the showrunner or the creator, but he was a writer and producer on the show. Uh, and that is The Office. Jack, what are your thoughts on The Office? Is it is it something you you you've watched? You rewatch? What are what are your feelings on The Office? I have probably seen The Office five or six times at this point. Yeah. Um, I had a phase uh, in my high school years where it was basically the only show that I watched. Um, I watch it pretty much anytime it's on cable on Comedy Central. At this point, I really just love the show, but. Specifically, what I love about it is the love that the ensemble seems to have for it. Uh, I don't know if you listened to Jenna Fisher and Angela Kinsey's podcast. I, I'm uh, shaking my head, but no, no, I have not. Um, mm -hmm. It, I, I like The Office. I don't know if I'd say I love it. And to be fair, I rewatch it. I have a list of shows that I just kind of have in the background while I work, and that's one of them. Mm -hmm. I am not the biggest fan of cringe comedy which The Office sometimes, especially early, really leaned oh, into. One and two are, like, 
not at all for the people who hate right. cringe comedy as like yourself and like, and like the the most notable episode like uh scott's tots which is a later uh, episode but like i i maybe have watched that once or twice it, it's mm -hmm. one it's a skip over but the show is propped up very well by steve carell and his supporting cast mm -hmm. uh, do you have any any episodes that really stand out or are favorites of yours one that Mike Schur actually wrote, which was the negotiation, oh, uh, the episode where Roy, who's Pam's ex fiance, mm -hmm. tries to attack Jim in the office, but Dwight saves him. Right. And there's this whole plot about Jim trying to thank Dwight, uh, Michael trying to negotiate a pay raise for himself and for his warehouse employee, Daryl. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are just. One, it's just a very well-structured episode. Two, it's got, I think, some of the funniest bits in the show. Um, when Michael finds out that he wore a woman's suit to the office, <laughs> yeah. it's just so good. And he's trying to defend it by being like, there were these bins of clothes, and everybody was grabbing them, and so I grabbed a suit, and it fit. So I don't think it's a woman's suit. At the very least, it's bisexual. <laughs> and I I am one who actually is, by no means was I happy to see Steve Carell go. Um, but I didn't hate the post-Steve Carell era like some people did, or at least disliked it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a big James Spader fan. So Robert California worked for me. Uh, like the Garden Party episode is a favorite of mine. Garden Party um, is, I think, the best prank that is done on the show oh, for sure. Oh, with the yeah, with the uh, the book that Jim the book. Wrote. Sorry, I'm kind of jumping all around here. Uh, I think probably one of the most uh, well received or probably considered one of the best episodes is the dinner party. Certainly, some cringe moments, but I think they are very effective throughout. I mean, I think we've all had good and bad dinner parties that we've been to and can relate to some degree any any characters that you were particularly fond of or is it really you mentioned that the whole cast kind of just worked mm -hmm. but any any characters in particular that you were uh, find stood out i love the accounting trio i've always <laughs> had an affinity for this dynamic that oscar angela and kevin have yeah uh they've described it as like the papa bear mama bear baby bear yeah. Uh, in the show, and then Kevin, of course, sees Oscar as Baby Bear. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, um, but, like, there's even, I think, in the end of season four, when Amy Ryan first enters the show, and Dwight tells her that Kevin is here on a special work program. Oh, it's man. so funny uh, to me. Right. Just the way that Brian Baumgartner just, like, interacts with her is like do you want an m and m <laughs> it's so good and then uh, the smash cut to his talk again where he's talking about how he's totally gonna do her because she's cute and helpful right oh man um speaking of brian mcguire one of the things that i think the show and especially mike sure shows in general um are really strong at are the cold opens so when you mentioned uh brian Baumgartner, uh the chili episode where he's coming in talking about this secret family recipe and then it just spills everywhere mm -hmm. always funny always nice. funny um and I, you know as far as cold opens go i think the one that always stands out is the uh the fake gym uh oh that's where, an excellent one where yeah randall park comes in and gaslights dwight into thinking that he was jim it's like oh i'm glad you'd never you'd never see race dwight like great so yeah to be respectful of time any other final thoughts on the office that we need to make sure we're covering before jumping to the next show uh as much as i love the office i'll actually transition us uh i'm glad that it gave way after season four for mike's show to go off and develop his own show yes and that show being parks and rec the amy poehler uh led show um, similar to The Office, I think probably had some speed bumps with season one and partly into season two, but really at, it kind of got halfway through season two, that show really learned how to fly. And mm -hmm. one of my all-time favorites, I mean, personally, I love it more than The Office. 
I'm kind of glad it broke away from the mockumentary style as the seasons went on. Uh, but just we we talked about his comedy having this good hearted humanistic warmth. That's the show in a nutshell. It's about people trying to do good and live their best lives and helping people and finding their way and growing and loving each other. And I could keep going with all the praise on it. It is just such a wonderful show. I watched Parks and Rec actually before I watched The Office. Oh, did you? Uh, they were both on Netflix around the same time, but I found it easier to get into Parks and Rec. Yeah. And even though I've probably seen The Office more at this point, I do think that overall Parks and Rec is the stronger show. I think as soon as it hits, you're, you're right, around the middle of season two is when it finds its stride. But as soon as you introduce Rob Lowe and Adam Scott, For it sure. takes off into becoming maybe one of the best shows of like the 2000s it's still baffling that the show was always struggling to stay on air it was always a question whether it was going to be canceled or not and now i still think it's probably one of the most streamed shows post its tv airing that mm -hmm. that is out there um i think one of my favorite episodes was actually an early season two one of that when they go hunting I think yeah. that that is, that is where Ron gets shot by Tom is always hilarious. Again, I'm an advocate for gun safety here on the Fancast at Four <laughs> podcast, but knowing that this actor was safe and got fake shot was hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, no, but you're right. I think the show really found its groove when they introduced uh, Adam Scott and Rob Lowe. I think you got to see all these other side characters really flesh themselves out. Mm -hmm. I think one of the best things about the show is that with a lot of sitcoms characters start to become caricatures of themselves and it and the quality worsens over time how i met your mother is a big example of that how my mother with, really struggles with that but with this show i think it is one of the rare shows where it works in its benefit i wouldn't say they become caricatures but their personality traits become a lot stronger you have ron swanson one of my all-time favorite characters really leaning into that lib libertarianism. You have Andy really leaning into that Dof character, April leaning into that that kind of dour, like evil, quote unquote, kind of character and so on. I mean, I could keep going through all of them. Um, I mean, the thing yeah. is that they don't really, they don't really allow the characters to repeat themselves that much. They're always willing to let the characters change if the story changes. Like Leslie, Leslie Nope does start out the show as being more of a Michael Scott type. She starts right. out the show as being a little bit more incompetent. Uh, there's like a whole thing in the pilot about, you know, the the lights going out because she didn't alert the night crew that they were going to be there. But by the end of the show, she is, and even honestly, even by like the end of season two, right. she is this dedicated government employee. And right. even though she never loses that, she does change as a character. She becomes more open with Ben. She be she allows herself these like she has like this entire arc in season four about her race to become a right. city counselor. And it's excellent. I think that might be my favorite season of the show. That is a great one. That is a really strong season. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, to the greater point, these characters, you see these characters grow and evolve for the better over time, and it is great. I think one of my favorite later episodes is where in in the finale or the final season, Leslie and Ron are who were the best of friends were arguing and their friends force them to lock them into this room and they have to reconcile. Mm -hmm. uh, don't want to spoil it for you who haven't listened, but another solid half hour of comedy. It is one of like the writing highlights of the show. Definitely. Definitely. Um I mean, I could again. We could make this whole podcast just about the these Mike Shore shows, which we really could. <laughs> like, um, I'm trying not to do, but mm -hmm. you know, if we ever start a Patreon, maybe we'll we'll do a retrospect <laughs> on, <laughs> on Mike Shore stuff. Yeah. Um, I, was just, I was just thinking about the episode where they make the uh, campaign ads for Leslie. Oh yeah, it's so so good. Paul Rudd as Bobby Newport just being like. My dad's friends with John Cougar Bellicam. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> my 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 great uncle or my uh, godfather's like viceroy to the principality of Liechtenstein or something like that. Oh man, yeah, just 
all the Tom, Jerry, and uh, Ben uh, just doing the Bobby Newport. Bobby Newport's never had a real <laughs> job. <laughs> And then you have Leslie's who listing the all these accomplishments. And uh, you didn't mention you were running for running for city council. <laughs> well, again, mention in the comments episodes you like or things about Parks and Rec you like because we love Parks and Rec too. Yes. Um, now let's move on to Mike Shore's first Fox, and then eventually NBC. Back to NBC. <laughs> Back to NBC venture. Um, the Andy Samberg led Brooklyn Nine Nine. Another show I absolutely adore, I'll, but I'll turn it to you, Jack. Is Brooklyn Nine Nine a show you've you've watched? Is that something? Where where do you stand on Brooklyn Nine Nine? It is a show that I've watched. It's a show that I've watched the least out of any Mike Shore shows. I have only watched it through once, and I greatly enjoyed it. But I would probably have the least to say about this show. Uh, I think this show is hilarious, though. Yeah. I it is like one of my go to watches if it's like ever if i'm like traveling or if, if like i wake up early and it's typically on comedy central i'll always put it on but it is not one that i've like sat down and rewatched the way that i sat down and rewatched parks and rec in the office fair, fair i think this one is definitely more of the traditional sitcom compared to some of his others that he has show run the office certainly very much a sitcom but compared to Parks and Rec, and the final one we're going to talk about. This definitely had some more sitcom, traditional sitcom tropes, where, and th this is another show I absolutely adore. The, and again, just a knockout cast. Uh, absolutely. A Andy Samberg, Melissa Fumero, Stephanie Beatriz, Joe LaTruglio, Terry Crews, Andre Brower, uh, Chelsea Peretti. Yeah, and the, the list is, is just great. And again, everyone is on fire and are at their peak as far as comedy goes. Mm -hmm. And this one is really his, Mike Shore's writer's room, really hit their stride as far as cold opens go. And the show that really hits home the cold open. It's got the best cold open in the show. I think we, I don't know if you're thinking of the one that I'm thinking of. I, I'll let you say, but we probably are. The I Want It That Way cold open. Oh, that one. So that is a great one. The one I'm actually thinking of, I love when, Holt played by Captain Holt played by Andre Brower, like loosens up or shows like breaks from that stoicism. Oh, it's so, so good. So it's the one, so good when he does that. There are there are two that stand out. It's one where they're all guessing why Amy, played by Melissa Fumero, is late because she's always on time. She's this stickler for the rules, and they're all guessing. And Captain Holt's like, I think there was an issue at the bank. She, Amy finally comes in and she's like, I'm sorry, there was an issue at the bank. And Holt's like, hot damn! Like, just <laughs> completely breaks care, like, gets me every time. And it's a gif I use consistently. Mm -hmm. other, I know, I've been, in, I'm in multiple chats with you. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> the other one being, they're trying to guess why Holt, uh, how Holt would react if he ate a marshmallow. Um, <laughs> so they're like, hmm this this glutinous sticky pillow and then Jolo Truglio's character is like mmm <laughs> they're like he's not gonna act like that Holt comes in eats a marshmallow and he's like mmm <laughs> like makes this high pitched squeal again hilarious if you haven't watched Brooklyn Nine-Nine you should I, um, I might now go rewatch it after we finish recording this I think this show certainly had to evolve especially with a lot of the even I don't want to say recent, but just over the last few years, more and more scrutiny on police conduct. Mm -hmm. And I think the show was put under a microscope because of that. And I think it actually responded pretty well. Again, this is coming from a white dude here. Well, cards on the table. So I, I don't want to speak for anyone who's had different views or experiences when it comes to police. But I think in response to all the negative headlines and news around police in the U.S. The show's final season, I think, really responded well to it. Um, because, no, it, it's certainly a glorified view of police. Absolutely. But, but I think with the inclusion of the diverse cast and all their different backgrounds, um, it's still a show I don't have any shame in revisiting. It threaded the needle very well with that. Yeah, as, or as well as they could have. 
and and not to do such a drastic change from from such a serious topic but i think this this show also does have a, a lot of heart because it does show the lives of these people outside of their duty as police i think that them being mm-hmm. police comes secondary the, them being detectives comes secondary to what their life is like outside of that exactly um, and i think that's the thing about all my short shows they're people first right but they're not it's not afraid to touch on tough topics mm-hmm. i think looking i'm trying to think i think my favorite episode of the show um is in a later season uh and it guest stars sterling k brown where Andre or um, Captain Hole played by Andre Brower and Jake Peralta played by Andy Samberg are in this intense interrogation with this perp played by Sterling K. Brown. And it is just a masterclass of comedy and uh, between Holt and Peralta versus stoic, really kind of smarmy character that Sterling K. Brown is playing. Mm-hmm. Um, it just it toes the line between subject matter, comedy, and I'm also a sucker for one like things shot in one room. Um, whether it's movies, TVs, like one room settings also are really catch my interest. Um, and this is that as well. Favorite episode of mine. I know you haven't watched it a ton. Any episodes that stand out to you as a, a favorite? Uh, none that I can think of off the top of my head right now. I do like Return of the King, which is the one that um, Melissa Fumero directed. Oh, I just yeah. watched that one recently. And then I also just... I I love the Lemon Miranda cameo. Oh yeah. I think it's in season six or seven. Yeah. As Amy's season brother. Six. As Amy's brother. Just nails it. For sure. And the I think the best thing about this show that really, as far as like the traditional traditional sitcom tropes go, are is kind of the callback to past things. I think the best episodes in general are the Halloween heists. I don't know if how familiar you are with those, but every season they do a Halloween heist. And yes. just the stakes get higher and higher. The <laughs> antics get crazier and crazier. It's so and good. So so good. Well, I also just love shows that like choose to center an episode around Halloween because you always have shows that like center a Christmas episode, maybe center a Thanksgiving episode, a Valentine's Day episode. Halloween always seems to like fly under the radar in terms of like the big episodes. Right. But you know, a show like Brooklyn Nine Nine, a show like Community, um, that have these yeah. event Halloween episodes. Right. Right. And it's funny, they, there is, in a later season, um, it starts on Halloween, but, like, something interrupted it, so they had to do move it to Easter, then to Cinco de Mayo. Like, they kept moving it to less mm-hmm. big holidays. Oh, so good. Any any final thoughts on Brooklyn Nine-Nine before we go to our last show? Uh, no, let's talk about The Good Place. <sighs> there it is, The Good Place. Um, I can easily say this is one of, if not my favorite show of all time. I adore The Good Place. It is... I'll let Jack, I'll let you talk before I go into my whole diatribe about it. Yeah, so this was a show that I think I watched the pilot of when it aired. Yeah. And I thought the pilot was really good, but I didn't ever pick back up with the show. Yeah. And then I watched it on Netflix in two days. Uh, <laughs> I was glued to my television, could not get me to move. I watched the first, the three seasons that were on Netflix at that point, and then I watched every episode of season four as it aired. Uh, So I am a film major, but I want to write television. And because of that, I like have really gone into studying television recently. I wrote a paper on community last year. Uh, I have like, deeply analyzed succession with my friends at midnight uh i do think the good place is maybe the best show that has been on tv in the last 25 to 30 years like it is um, a near perfect show yeah it is beyond like anything really that has been put to television before especially on like a cable network it's incredible. Right. Yeah, yeah. On on your standard network TV, like I'm baffled the show worked. But that also shows you the trust that networks had in Mike Shore at the time. They mm-hmm. had success with Parks and Rec and Brooklyn Nine Nine. And if anything, you saw that there was a fandom willing to want these shows to come back, like you had with Brooklyn Nine Nine getting 
picked up by NBC and the the resurgence of Parks and Rec on streaming, like this guy makes quality television. And this show, to take a premise that is essentially a sitcom about philosophy, about mm -hmm. human ethics, and make it both funny, heartfelt, dramatic, all in a 20, 25 ep minute episode is, is mind boggling. And it's certainly propped up by this cast, a cast that lightning in a bottle, like all of his other casts, yeah. it's magic. Well, it's funny because like you have people who were fairly well known at that time. You had Kristen Bell and Ted Danson. Right. Who were like, you know, like frozen in cheers. Like you have these right. two megastars who were the only people that knew what the twist in season one was, which we won't spoil here. No, you know, you know, we, we are going. We are. We can't not talk about it. So we are going to be. Spoiling. Oh, we are going. To, okay, we're, we are we're going spoil. to be spoiling. Excellent. So but you have fair warning, fair warning, listeners. But then you have like someone like Jamila Jamil, who is now in She Hulk. You have William Jackson Harper, who's like in Midsommar and is. He's on, I, the, I he's on the Peacock show, The Resort. He's mm -hmm. he's starting to pick up steam as an actor. Man, um, as you can do, who just got picked up for the Acolyte uh, right. and yes. was in Top Gun Maverick. Don't get me started on how he was robbed of more screen time in Top Gun Maverick. Uh, and Darcy Carden, who like oh was a minor character at the beginning, and by season four, she was getting an Emmy nomination. Another straight crush of mine, Darcy Carden. She's so good on the show. Fantastic. I will say so fantastic. 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 Uh, <laughs> um, the, this cast is wonderful. And what's so lovely is that you take a pair of characters and each of them has some sort of strong bond or thing that buys them, whether it's romantic, whether it's fraternal. Uh, it's There's something between every pair of characters mm -hmm. that is so wonderful and so fleshed out that it, it is so... I, I can't wait to rewatch it anytime I get the chance. I need to mm -hmm. pace myself because I don't want to get burnt out. So I need to I need to give it some time before I rewatch because I want to keep loving it. But the show, one thing that I give this show credit for to my own dismay is that it ended on its own terms. It is a show that knew it wasn't going to last forever. It took its few seasons that it had and made the most of it. Certainly some people might argue season four, it kind of was spinning its wheels at the beginning. I disagree, but again, I unabashedly love the show. Oh, I think the ending of season four is brilliantly done. Oh, the finale, the finale is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think it's mostly when they're doing the experiment to try and proof of concept the the stuff with like the new people being brought in to do the experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's talk about that twist. Let's talk. I'm going. Sorry, I'm jumping all around. This this show just makes me giddy. If it you makes you think, <laughs> it does. But one of the most well executed twists. In all of television, I, I mean, I certainly there are others that I could probably bring up, but this one, I think if, if you realized it good on you, I'm sure there were clues that led up to it. But just the jaw dropping twist where Christian Bell's like, they're all arguing, like, who's going to go to the bad place? Who's going to stay in the good place? And then you see the light bulb click in Christian Bell's character, which is like, holy forking shirt balls. This is the bad place. Mm -hmm. And then you have that maniacal laugh by Ted Danson. That is a perfect, perfect 15 seconds of TV. It's so well done. And then I did actually go back and rewatch season one after yeah. that twist. The clues are all there. Right. It's right. so good. They do such a good job of saying like, it is hers and um, and Jason Mendoza's fault for causing all this this stuff. But then mm. you see it, it's like, oh shit! Like this this was so obvious, but still, mm -hmm. like, it was right in front of your face, and that sometimes is the best hiding spot for this stuff. Absolutely. Um, and and again, we we talked about it briefly. The show is still extremely smart. 
each episode or every few episodes is talking about some philosophical theory or or postulation. Um, one of my favorites is in season two where they're uh, working with Michael to try and hide from the bad place that his experiment failed. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to teach Michael, this demon played by Ted Danson, ethics. So they're doing the trolley problem. The trolley problem is the such a good episode. funniest, funniest moment is when they make it real. They're in the trolley and they're forcing Chidi, who is this anxious, indecisive character, to do the trolley problem. He fails. Guts splatter all over. One of the most gross things I've seen in a network comedy, but mind you. So, so funny. He flew into my mouth. Like, <laughs> oh man, oh, it's so good. It's just every. I also I love this season two finale as well. Yes, like the whole again, like. I think that's another one that bridges Mike Schur comedy and drama so well. When Eleanor is faced with her final challenge from the judge, where yeah. she's told, oh no, you and Sheedy passed, you're in the good place, and she realizes that that's her challenge, is a brilliant moment. And then you cut to Sheedy, whose challenge is trying to pick, pick a, a hat. hat. It's a hat. It's a hat. <laughs> or, and, yeah, you got Jason playing Madden, like, and then Tahani having go through this hallway where in each room is a different set of people uh, mm -hmm. saying what they really think about her. Like, that would be a tough one for me to go mm -hmm. down. And she almost passes it, but she can't not hear what her parents think. Right. And it's brutally done. And then the fact that Eleanor tells her friends, no, I also failed. And and you, you mentioned the judge. Maya Rudolph is fan freaking tastic as Crushes the judge. It. Like, again, and that's another one where, the, like, the Mike Schur supporting cast just brings it. Adam Scott just playing his oh, character crappy. from Step Brothers again, yeah. but as a demon. And then you have Mark Evan Jackson, head of, Sean, head of the bad place, who was a perfect foil to Ted Danson. He was this guy that probably got very along very well with, with Michael, Ted Danson's character. Mike Schur just has an eye for finding the right people to mm -hmm. play these small roles or these these non-lead roles and that i mean it it just builds a stronger foundation for all of his shows absolutely and the last thing i want to talk about the good place is the finale one of one of the best finales of all time heartbreaking <sighs> so good it is very bittersweet but it is the perfect ending for this show Mm -hmm. if, if you have, I mean, I hope you didn't listen to any of the spoilers and you watch this if you haven't before. I, I cannot recommend a show further enough. Just the realization that eternal life is, is not, not the answer and that, you know, you can do all you want to do in this afterlife, but sometimes, sometimes it's just right to go back, be in the universe in whatever, mm -hmm. as, as energy, as good spirit, you know, the show ended not not long before my my dad passed so i i think about this quote that when chidi and eleanor are sitting together looking out onto the ocean um as chidi is letting her know that he's ready to go through the path passageway that makes him be part of the universe again it's picture a wave in the ocean you can see it measure it its height the way the sunlight refracts when it passes through, and it's there, and you can see it. You know what it is. It's a wave. And then it crashes in the shore, and it's gone. But the water is still there. The wave was just a different way for the water to be for a little while. You know it's one conception of death for Buddhists. The wave returns to the ocean, where it came from, and where it's supposed to be. While... Certainly, it's it's still been hard processing the loss of my father. Taking some solace in this gave me comfort, thinking that even if my dad is just positive force in the universe now, it gives me some comfort. And mm -hmm. um, I I can thank the show for that as well, because yeah, it's it's not just about comedy or human ethics. It's how we deal with grief, loss, and, and what happens after we die. Mm -hmm. Which 
doesn't sound like great source material for comedy, but man, but it would is. I be wrong? Would I be wrong, man? And um, again, that's all Mike Shore. That's right. his brand. That's finding the good and the funny in these really important questions. Right. So, with that said, if you haven't watched the show, hopefully you weren't spoiled by any spoiler talk we had. Regardless, you should still go watch it. You have watched it. Watch it again. Watch it again it, for sure. Because it's that damn good. We we talked about these a lot longer than we probably have on some other episodes. But when we decided to do this episode, I was really excited because these three, four, including The Office, are some of my favorite pieces of media that I've watched. And it's really a credit to their creator, Mike Shore. But, you know, with that said, let's let's get back on track. Let's talk about why we're here. And, you know, let's cast a Fantastic Four TV show if Mike mm-hmm. Shore were in charge. You know how this works at this point if you're a regular listener. Jack is going to go through his list of main cast members. Reed Richard, Sue Storm, Johnny Storm, Ben Grimm, Dr. Doom. Maybe have a brief discussion. I will go through my list. And then I will ask some questions before he gets into his pitch. He will pitch his show. I will pitch my show. And that is that. So let's not delay any further. Jack, who have you cast in a Mike Shore led Fantastic Four TV show? For my Reed Richards, uh, I have chosen an actor who appeared in Mike Shore's show that he co created with Ed Helms, Rutherford Falls. But most people probably know him better as Alexis's on again, off again boyfriend from Schitt's Creek. Uh, Ted, I cast oh, Dustin Ted. Milligan as my Reed Richards. Great choice. I- Ted is great. I love Schitt's Creek. I haven't watched Rutherford Falls, but I do love it. Nor have I. But t- Justin Milligan is also just a very charming, funny like, person. And he, very attractive. And he <laughs> plays off of uh, Annie Murphy so well in that show. And I feel like he would be an excellent Reed Richards. I'm excited to see, knowing that dynamic between him and Annie Murphy in Schitt's Creek, I'm excited to see who you've cast as your Sue Storm to play opposite of him. So who, who's your Sue Storm? My Sue Storm is Natalie Morales, and Ooh. she played Tom's girlfriend, Lucy, on Parks and Recreation. She also led a, a short-run show called uh, Abby's on, I believe, NBC. Did barely, I don't think it lasted a full season. I enjoyed it, but uh, another produced, a show produced by Mike Shore. I have always found her to be a very, again, charming, charismatic actor. Uh, again, the the way that she relates to people in the movies and TV shows that I've seen her, she's in a movie called Language Lessons with one of the Duplass brothers, where it's literally just the two of them over Zoom for about 95 minutes. She really carries the film. And the way that she interacts with, I think it's Jay Duplass, uh, is kind of amazing to watch she also directed the film and she's just she's wonderful so she's my sue storm she's not in parks and rec a lot she makes a brief appearance early in the show and then returns in the final season i think the thing that stands out about her at least in the parks and rec role is that uh, tom is a very bombastic character has a lot of a lot of personality, confidence, some of it unearned, some of it false confidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she shuts that down. She does not, she will not let anyone get an inch on her. She has a lot of confidence. She has a lot of uh, personality herself, and she can keep up. Mm-hmm. And I think that is really important with a Sue Storm. I think it also says something that she's only in about, I think, 10 or so episodes of Parks and Rec, but I remember almost every moment right. she's in. She's has like maybe two or three scenes in the end of the world party episode yeah. and they're my favorite scenes in that episode agreed agreed because it she is able to bring out in her scene partner a lot of heart and that's a real credit to to an actor to be able to through your work get a b- better performance out of the person you're working with mm-hmm. uh, what about her brother johnny so i am Bending genders here a little bit. Awesome. Uh, for my Jenny Storm, I have cast Hannah Einbinder, 
uh, who is one of the leads on the executive produced by Mike Shore show Hacks on HBO Max. Awesome. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, on Hacks, uh, Hannah Einbinder plays a character named Ava, who is a young comedy writer who made an insensitive tweet uh, and is unable to find work because of it and has a reputation for being self-centered and arrogant. Uh, if that doesn't sound <laughs> like Johnny Storm, I don't know what does. I mean, I could see Johnny Storm getting canceled over a tweet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I yeah, uh, I, I I haven't watched Hacks myself. Is that a show you've you've watched? Hacks is brilliant. I would highly recommend the show. Oh, Gene oh, Smart and Hannah Einbinder play off each other so well. I mean, Gene Smart's won a few Emmys for her role in Hacks, mm-hmm. so um, I I really should give it a shot. Do you, anything um about her do you see her stepping into action pretty well i mean it's going to be a very probably cg heavy character in some regard assuming i I, I, I could absolutely see her stepping into action quite well you know i I also feel like if you're going to continue this on for a long time you know she's pretty young i could see her leading a team in the future uh i just feel like she would fit perfectly into that role awesome uh what about um, kind of the butt of a lot of Johnny's jokes, Ben Grimm, who do you have cast? Uh, Captain Holt, Andre Brower. Oh, wonderful. Uh, wonderful. Again, got, he, I feel like, I think that was the one that came to me first, was just, if I'm going to do a Mike Shore Fantastic Four show, Andre Brower would be the ultimate Ben Grimm slash The Thing. I love it. I mean, it's never bad casting Andre Brower in anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think giving him a role where it is he is kind of focusing on his voice and his stoicism, it's a great choice. Mm-hmm. Um, Captain Holt is one of the all-time great TV characters, and uh, I think yeah, I knowing where we just where we re- recently talked about him kind of being this very stoic character that has bursts of excitement or or rage seems kind of perfect for a Ben Grimm. Mm-hmm. And now what about the Fantastic Four's nemesis, Dr. Doom? You know, I thought about this one a lot. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I was really trying to think about what actor in a Mike Shore show would be the best at playing a smarmy, self-centered douchebag. Uh, and so I picked a uh, smarmy, self-centered douchebag writer, director, actor, producer of vengeance bj novak <laughs> oh tell us how you really feel about the <laughs> <Jay Novak. laughs> uh so so you just think his general smarminess is is what makes him fit you know i i also do think that bj novak is a very talented actor i think that he's also a very talented writer uh i think he thinks he's a very uh, <laughs> talented actor and writer uh <laughs> I have a whole story about this that I will probably tell Dan off air, but uh, I also just think that BJ Novak would be an excellent Doctor Doom. Just even in general, I feel like he would bring a really good comedic edge to Doctor Doom that the character might miss in other iterations. I'm really fascinated by the dynamic between a BJ Novak and a Dustin Milligan. Because again, all I really have reference for is Ted from Schitt's Creek, and just seeing him versus like the characters we've seen B.J. Novak play. Ryan from The Office versus Ted from <laughs> Schitt's Creek would be an amazing <laughs> battle of woods. Uh, when you were talking about smarmy, self-centered jackasses, uh, at first I thought you might have uh, cast uh, John uh, Glasser, who played Jeremy Jam in Parks and Rec. <laughs> uh, like I would have, I would. I did not cast him as Doctor Doom, but I would also have loved to see a Jeremy Jam Doctor Doom. You just got doomed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I might need to change things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to, but I, I, uh, I have so many thoughts now. <laughs> uh, great cast. I don't know if it was tough for you. Uh, but with some of these directors we've done, one problem is we are very limited on our choices. But when you're looking at a TV producer, especially one as prolific as Mike Shore, who's worked with so many people, mm-hmm. it gets very overwhelming. The amount of, uh, if we're including anything he's written, produced, uh, or produced or show ran, like the amount of 
great top quality actors, dramatic, comedic, both it was tough to whittle down. Uh, yeah, and you will see, sure. it, you will see in my pitch that I kind of cheated. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, for my cast, um, I've probably started with a pretty conventional choice. Um, at least when you're thinking of Mike Shore for Reed Richards, and I went with Parks and Rec, The Good Place is Adam Scott. Really, I, I was between two people. Uh, I was between him and William Jackson Harper, which who I know is a very popular fan cast, and I would love to see him play Reed Richards. He would be great, but they'd both be great. Adam, yeah. I feel like Adam Scott would be wonderful. Adam Scott, I feel like of all the people who Mike Shore has worked with, seems the most Reed Richards of any of the actors that Mike Shore has worked with. Uh, he has played he has played very arrogant. He has played uh fatherly. He has played he's played all the things that makes Reed Richards Reed Richards. And if we're looking at this as a potential comedy, his his anxieties, his um phobias, his anything that might come to it to make Reed Richards a little more humorous too, I think um Adam Scott has the ability to play both the serious and the comedic versions of Reed Richards and do mm -hmm. it um do it perfectly. Have speaking of Adam Scott, have you ever have you watched Severance? It's not one I I've heard. Oh, okay. Okay. Um it is one I've heard he's great in that another where the cast is great. So I need to add it to my list along with Hacks. Um but yeah, it's I'm glad to see he's starting to get roles where he is the lead as well. Mm -hmm. Uh so yes, Adam Scott is my Reed Richards. For my Sue Storm, I'm going to Brooklyn Nine Nine and I am casting Stephanie Beatriz, who plays Officer uh or Detective Rosa Diaz. Whereas I think I'm probably going to the extreme end of Sue Storm here, whereas Stephanie Beatriz as Rosa is this very tough, no nonsense, kind of scary character who is still mm -hmm. a softie on the inside in a lot of ways. And that's how I see Sue Storm kind of being. I don't want her by any means to be uh, a replica of Rosa Diaz, but I do see her taking some of that and using it for comedy as far as her being Sue Storm. And I do think there's actually a fun dynamic between her and Adam Scott that might not be on the face of it something you'd expect, but I do think they would work well off of each other. I think they would play excellently off one another. We would, as far as Johnny Storm, her brother. We'd find some way to explain how they're related if we're going the fan four stick route of adoption or foster care or something. Um, I cast the the chaotic Jason Mendoza from <laughs> The Good Place, Manny Jacinto. I have such a love and a tiny crush on Manny Jacinto. Um, he he got he got the shaft when it came to Top Gun Maverick. He should have gotten way more screen time than some of those some of those other actors, but hey, I am not Tom Cruise making those decisions. Yep, uh, Manny, justice for Manny Jacinto. Um, but he's I, so so funny on the Good Place. I see him being a smarter man or a smarter Jason as mm -hmm. Johnny Storm. I mean, Jason Mendoza is a dummy. He's a big old dummy, a lovable dummy, but a big old dummy. But stupid as hell, <laughs> right? Um, and you know, he does have a proclivity for Molotov cocktails, so he does know he is good around fire. There you uh, go. <laughs> but I see, I see him being a uh, maybe a more a, more of a wise ass than a dumbass as Johnny. Mm -hmm. And from other stuff I've seen him in, certainly within Manny Jacinto's uh, capabilities. As for Ben Grimm, uh, I'm going back to Parks and Rec, a character who had. I wouldn't say a small role, but he was certainly a side character. I'm casting Sonic himself, Ben Schwartz, as Ben Grimm. That's interesting. <laughs> I I think he has the ability to to show some of that that rage. He is a, a very lovable in some regards. He's very. I want to see him challenge himself too to be kind of that more stoic Ben Grimm too. But also, this is a comedy. Mm -hmm. I love the thought of Ben Schwartz and Manny Jacinto getting into hijinks. Whether it's it's Johnny Storm started and Ben Schwartz as Ben Grimm trying to stave it off or have to get involved not on his own accord. I love the, the buddy aspect of the two of those actors working together, which mm -hmm. led me to cast Ben Schwartz. 
did you ever watch the after party on Apple? i did watch the after party and he was I, great on that show great. yeah and that that was gave me more confidence in casting him as ben Grimm after seeing him uh in that show another show mm-hmm. you all should watch we're just yes, gonna watch the after party this this party this this party this podcast is just gonna be us telling you what tv shows you should watch also essentially yeah <laughs> Finally, at least in regards to this main cast, we have Doctor Doom, and I am casting one of my favorite TV actors as in the uh, in the role of Doctor Doom, mm-hmm. Nick Offerman. To preface, in my show, I feel some time has passed, and he has joined forces question mark with the Fantastic Four. So I am looking for that more stoic but humorous Doctor Doom. This, I am making this a comedy. There's going to be some drama. There's going to be some action infused. But at the heart, it's a Mike Shore show. It's going to be funny. And I want funny people that I like in these shows. And Nick Offerman checks those boxes. And I also think he wouldn't mind wearing the mask. And he could do the voice that I think his voice is believable as do as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so that's, that's why I went that route. I love... Again, Jack can attest. I had three different casts going around before <laughs> yeah. I finally settled on this one. There were, there were that many people, and they were all different. So it, there were so many people that could have been chosen. Would Nick Offerman still have the mustache as Von Doom? I kind of imagine there would be like a little cutout on the mask, <laughs> whether it's metal itself or open for the mustache. Uh, I will leave that up to the creatives. I'm just cast. I'm just in casting. <laughs> well, that that is my cast. I think we both have very interesting, a little different casts, though. Again, they are going to be in the same same show, or at least in the mind of the same person we are working with. And again, that's what makes him so great. He either finds or cultivates or brings out stellar talent. With that said, uh, Jack, if you're ready to get into your pitches, I, I am. I'm ready. So, first question, is your show, whether it be the pilot or some aspect of your show, going to go over the character's origins? No. Will there be any ties to the MCU? No. Don't know if I'm surprised, but fascinating nonetheless. Let's get into your pitch. So, two things. One, I am not a comedy writer like Mike Shore. I have written the story. He can write the jokes. Two. Because it's a Mike Shore show, I would want it to go on for multiple seasons, but I just wanted to focus this pitch on the first season, which in my mind would be six episodes. At this point, the group have had their powers for about three years and are in a good rhythm. The first episode kind of shows us the routine. Reed and Sue are already married and living together. Jenny wakes up in a room not knowing which girl she's just slept with, and Ben is having a nice breakfast with his fiancée, Alicia. They all convene at the Baxter building, but when they arrive, they see an unexpected scene. Police tape is drawn over the entrance. There are police, fire, and ambulances up and down the block. They are told that they cannot enter for a classified reason, even after the four explain who they are. They turn away until they remember that mm, Sue is invisible. She sneaks into the Baxter building where she sees a group of masked men in the middle of a robbery holding a group of interns hostage. Back on the ground, Reed, Jenny, and Ben get an update from Sue as to what's happening. They once again try to explain to the law enforcement that they know what's happening but are told to turn away before they're placed under arrest. Jenny grows increasingly restless, urging Reed and Ben that they need to get up there with Sue and use their powers. Ben is immediately resistant, saying that if the police don't believe this to be their place, then why should it be? This leaves Reed as the final vote. Back up in the building, Sue turns visible again and slowly starts to lead an intern away from the hostages. She reveals that if she turns invisible while touching another person, they can also become invisible. However, the masked men notice that one of their hostages is missing, threaten to start open fire. Before they do, the window crashes open and Reed, Jenny, and Ben stand heroically in the wreckage. They have a fight with the masked men, which they easily win. Sue, however, does not fight, remaining invisible with the intern that she has saved. When Reed, Jenny, and Ben bring the hostages out of the building, they are immediately placed under arrest with Sue and the intern, who has introduced himself as Victor, having successfully slipped away. Sue realizes what has happened to Reed, Jenny, and Ben and tells Victor to come with her. 
Reed, Jenny, and Ben are in jail, and Ben is refusing to talk to either Reed or Jenny. Reed feels regretful about his decision, but Jenny firmly stands by it. Their argument of words starts to turn into an all-out brawl in their cell. It's cut off, however, by a guard that tells them that their bail has been posted by Sue. They are released from prison, but told that they will still need to stand trial for their actions, which could put them back in jail. This kicks off the main question that the show is going to be presenting. What Mike Schur has always been good at is integrating philosophical problems into a somewhat fantastical world. Good Place obviously stands out as a prime example of this, but even a show like Parks and Rec's main question is about the responsibilities that local government officials have to their citizens. So the overarching question of this show is about how a group of local enhanced individuals should exercise their power. And even though this question was kind of asked in the MCU by Civil War, I want to take it in a sort of different direction. Although episodes would feature the occasional grand set piece, the majority of the story would be these characters discussing what their viewpoints are on the obligation of being heroes. The status symbol of the superhuman versus, say, a police officer. Whether it's okay to exploit your power in order to evade the law the way that Sue did. About halfway through the show, it's revealed that Victor the intern is from Latveria and is living in the country illegally, which forces the four to ask what their responsibility is to him now. So I'll just run down what each character's basic ideology is. Reed sees their powers as a part of them, but not what makes them. They were normal human beings before they gained these abilities, and he doesn't think that their addition should change them as people. Sue initially sides with Reed on this matter, but as the season goes on, she sees the different ways that people in their lives view them. The sensationalism of the trial of the Fantastic Four. And by the end of the show, she comes to the conclusion that she will never just be sue storm again she's always going to be the invisible woman now and it's better to embrace that side of herself than push it down jenny sees the consequences that they suffer as a result of their superpowers as hypocritical believing that anyone who had their powers would have done what we did in that situation she has an incredibly optimistic viewpoint on humanity something that ben consistently chastises her for and in case that didn't make it clear, Ben has pretty much the opposite viewpoint of Jenny, and even Reed. He sees Ben Grimm and the Thing as two entirely separate entities, but he's annoyed that he is only seen as the Thing. He's never going to be seen as Ben again. Even if they were to all wake up one day and lose their powers, people would just see the hideous rock monster they saw before. To him, images are irreversible. Victor has a similar idea to Jenny, saying that it's hypocritical what they're being put through, but views humanity in a much more pessimistic light. The injustices that he's suffered as someone from Latveria have driven him to anger. In his words, nearly 40 years old and he's still an intern. These viewpoints clash and change and compromise up to the day in court for Reed, Jenny, and Ben, which is the season one finale. The night before the trial, Sue, who has been growing suspicious of Victor's more and more unbridled anger, finds out that he had staged the entire robbery of the Baxter building from episode one, and that he had created devices that mind control both the robbers as well as law enforcement. She also finds out that Victor is planning on using that mind control on the jury that's presiding over the case of Reed, Jenny, and Ben. She confronts him about this the next day at the courthouse and tells him that if he uses mind control, she will have him sent back to Liberia. Victor is silent for a moment after this, then smiles and calls her out for abandoning her moral compass. The idea that she would go so far to protect her friends that she would send someone back to a country that broke them down until they were nothing. He breaks the device himself and exits the courthouse, leaving Sue alone. She goes back into the courtroom as the jury has finished deliberating, definitively no longer under mind control. However, to Sue's complete shock, the jury finds Reed, Jenny, and Ben guilty still, sentencing them each to three months in prison plus one year of probation. Additionally, they are told that neither they nor their fourth, as Sue is referred to, may use their powers in a situation that the law can either handle or is in the process of handling. Reed, Jenny, and Ben go to jail as Sue goes back to her now empty home. She sees an envelope on her bed marked Sue and opens it up. Immediately, something small jumps out and attaches itself to her temple, turning on. That's the end of season one. Wonderful. I love it. Uh, I think I think that's very sure. I'd, I'd love to see him make sure also kind of take on like the legal aspects of of this as well. I think that's a different kind of um, avenue. I certainly we've seen the judge in the good place, but to take on the actual U.S. legal process, I think is fascinating. No, it it seems extremely fitting, and I would watch the hell out of that show. 
Unfortunately, no musical numbers uh, oh, yet. Man, I mean, every good show has some sort of musical. Like, if you look at Scrubs, certainly that has a great uh, musical episode. So I'm sure later seasons they might they might uh... for sure. <laughs> great pitch, and certainly certainly fits everything that we've seen from Mike Shore, and I can totally see your cast in those roles as well. Um, now, now getting into my pitch. Um, you guys should ask though. Yeah. Origin film? Origin TV show? It is not. Set in the MCU. It is. This will be right. a Disney Plus TV show. Let's hear it. Speaking of Disney Plus, I am still mad that Disney Plus has ignored my pitch for the sequel to The Santa Claus, The Santa Suit, which would have been much better than what we're getting. Yeah, no. Currently. The, Sa the Santa Suit is brilliant. Uh, Disney, you dropped the ball. I'm not going to go on a tangent. I am not going to go on a tangent. I am not going to go on a tangent on the brilliance of the Santa suit, but Disney, I'm waiting. Anyhow, for my show, I'm not going to go into as detailed of like a season overview, but I am going to pitch kind of the general idea of the show and some episode ideas and a big ass cast that I'm filling out <laughs> with it. Um, Cause I think one thing that's really important or that we've seen from Mike Shore shows is an extremely large cast of characters, cast of diverse characters, a cast of funny characters that pop in out various times, even if they're not the main cast themselves. So I kind of vision, envision this after the multiverse saga is over and the Fantastic Four doing whatever their involvement was in phase six concluding the multiverse saga kang's done his thing there's potentially secret wars that gets finished off and now we're left with the aftermath so the fantastic four start what is called in the comic books the future foundation and their task is to essentially fix or maintain the multiverse and they have recruited a whole bunch of different characters to help be part of this mission that this future foundation is set forth and i think that is the general premise of the show is the the troubles the the goofs the oopsies the the dangers that come with trying to uh not have the multiverse be an issue anymore because we've seen throughout the current phase it's starting to be a problem some other characters i see i do see jamila jamil from the good place, we're making cameos here and there as Titania, as she has in She Hulk. I see maybe in the pilot episode, we have Chris Pratt coming in as Star Lord, maybe being the impetus for like, hey, we need your help, Fantastic Four, to do this thing. I see uh, Darcy Carden being a, a main side character as Alicia Masters or the girlfriend of Ben Grimm, William Jackson Harper coming in as Silver Surfer. So, which means that Galactus may come in. I see Aubrey Plaza playing an older version of Valeria Richards, the daughter of Reed and Sue. I see Mark Evan Jackson playing this character called Dragon Man, who is a main feature in the Future Foundation comics. There are these characters called the Moloids. There are four aliens that had some association with Mole Man, but they're aliens. And I see them being voiced by Neil Flynn, the janitor from Scrubs who had a part in the, at the show Abby's that we talked about briefly. Uh, Joe Lotruglio from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Tia Sakar, who played Vicky in The Good Place. And Billy Eichner, all voicing the four Moloids of the Future Foundation. I see playing the son of Reed and Sue. And again, an older version who may have come through some sort of multiversal portal. Uh, being played by Moses Storm. Moses Storm had a small part, and I don't remember which show off the top of my head, but he was recently in a show that I love on Paramount Plus called Players, a mockumentary show that features competitive gaming, mostly around League of Legends. He played a character who went by the call sign Guru, who was part of the main team that is being featured in the show. They get into one uh, competitive match. They win. He quits to start this kind of lifestyle gaming brand called Never Lost, and he's just a shit weasel. He's the biggest shit weasel, and I love it. I'm not gonna again. I'm not gonna make this a player's podcast, but you should. If you have Paramount Plus, 
or you haven't used your free trial yet and you like video games, or if you don't, watch Players. Jack, have you watched Players? If you like good comedy shows written by funny people, watch Players. The writers of and creators of American Vandal, if you haven't watched American Vandal, you should watch that. We should have a list. I, I might tweet out a list of all the shows we recommend for you to watch, listeners. We'll, we'll put, we should put it in the description as well. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. So Moses Storm as Franklin Richards. I have John Krasinski popping in every now and then as a character named Nathaniel Richards. Kirby Howell Baptiste from The Good Place playing Miss Thing. Uh, who is a model that has been a member of the Fantastic Four at points and was was or may be still the wife of Johnny Storm. And then finally, I have Andre Brower, Captain Holt, playing Galactus. So I do see Galactus being either introduced or a big, big villain in this show at some point. And again, it's still I still kind of view it being on the comedic side, but there's still going to be action. We've seen from these other some of these other Disney Plus shows, they are willing to go into comedy, but still have high superhero stakes. And that's what I want with this gigantic cast. One arc that I'm really fascinated by, though, is because we're dealing with the multiverse, there is an infinite amount of possibilities in the multiverse. So I see the main cast exploring different multiverse versions of themselves. Maybe they're caught in some sort of multiverse loop or whatever, and they keep kind of like in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, where they keep getting sucked through different uh, multiverses. And I see them essentially passing through the Mike Shore multiverse, where they come across versions of themselves, but they look like characters from other Mike Shore shows. So we see in one universe... Um, a Reed, Sue, Johnny, Ben, and Dr. Doom played respectively by Adam Scott, Amy Poehler, Aziz Ansari, Jim O'Hare, and Jason uh, Matsukas. In another version, also a Parks and Rec style universe, but Reed is played by Rob Lowe, Sue is Rashida Jones, Johnny is Ben Schwartz, Ben, ben Grimm is actually Aubrey Plaza, and then Dr. Doom, call back to what we were talking about per, uh, before, John Glasser playing Jeremy Jamfain playing Dr. Doom. Then we get sucked into the Office version, where it's John Krasinski, the popular fan cast of Reed Richards, being Reed Richards, Jenna Fisher as Sue Storm, Mindy Kaling as Johnny Storm, Ed Helms as Ben Grimm, and Rain Wilson as Doctor Doom. We get into a Brooklyn Nine-Nine one. Andy Samberg, Melissa Fumero, Joe Latruglio, Andre Brower, Kira Sedgwick played Madeline Wunsch as the main cast and Madeline Wunsch being the villain or the Doctor. Brenda Dude. Lee Johnson as Doctor Doom. That's excellent. <laughs> um, and then finally, we get into a good place version of the Fantastic Four with William Jackson Harper, the one who I was so close to casting as really it, it kind of couldn't work out too, too much better. Um, because we already have Jamila Jamil cast, I could not cast her further. We have William Jackson Harper as Reed Richards, Kristen Bell as Sue Storm, Manny Jacinto as Johnny, uh, Darcy Carden as Ben Grimm, and Ted Danson as Doctor Doom. So it's whether it's a few each episode's a different group or they're all in one episode set through. I see this being a big arc where Mike Shore gets to utilize all these great actors he's worked with before to riff off how they'd play these characters. So while I don't have more episodes fleshed out, I see this large, diverse cast coming together, each having their own side stories here and there. Um, Moloids getting into dysfunction. Evan, Mark Evan Jackson is Dragon Man trying to wrangle all these people together. And the main cast doing their A-plot stories. But really, a lot of it has to deal with maybe adventures in the multiverse. You, you certainly will have... Ben Schwartz, Manny Jacinto getting into just antics in real life. You might see Tom Holland because Johnny and Spider-Man are friends in a lot of comic iterations. So I see a lot of cameo potential from other MCU worlds or actors. There's still a whole list of actors I haven't even touched on that he's worked with that are brilliant. That's the bones of the show. And I really just want to see the Mike Shore multiverse. I, I do too. <laughs> uh, and I really, I do think in some regards it doesn't break the mcu conventions we've gotten so far oh and absolutely cer certainly it leans more in the funny and it would be very mike shore heavy but mm -hmm. even just this concept i think works even if it's not this specific showrunner and these specific actors 
I think a future foundation show could work like this. Even it's if it's almost not. like a live action what if. Yes, exactly. But exactly. with Mike Sure characters. And that's excellent. I, I think so. Uh, and I'm glad you were on board. We're we're getting close to the end here. Any other final thoughts on well, you know, anything. We talked about Mamma Mia. We talked about the Santa Claus. We talked about Mike Sh- The Santa Mike Suit. Sh- yeah, the Santa Suit. Disney. If you want to hear about it, just DM me. I will I will tell you about my genius idea about the Santa Suit. Um, you better not steal it. Well no. I, I have the receipts. I've tweeted Disney Plus. Anyway, any final thoughts? Anything about Mike Shore, the Fantastic Four, TV in general that you want to say before we uh, wrap things up? I'm going to go watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine again. <laughs> <laughs> go grab a child-sized drink from Punch Burger. <laughs> it is actually the size of a child. <laughs> we, could, we could probably talk for another hour, Jack, but oh, we, we won't do that. The, the TV, ep- the TV <laughs> episode's going to go nuts. But I think one thing that I am looking forward to is maybe doing another one of these with a different with a different one. Um, we've been we've been some preliminary talks with previous two time guest John Lestrina about John Lestrina, John Lestrina, friend of the show, friend of the show, about doing a Dick Wolf inspired episode. Dun, 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 dun. Fantastic for. See, we got our music in there. <laughs> Before we go too crazy here, uh, in this fever dream, this Mike Shore fever dream, that is our show. Our fan castings and pitches for a Mike Shore Fantastic Four TV show are done. We hope you, the listeners, enjoyed our exploration into this what if scenario. I want to make special note that the Fan Cast at Four podcast is hosted for free on Anchor. We encourage you, if you have your own podcast idea, to check out Anchor. It is really a great resource for getting your idea off the ground. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. If you are listening on YouTube, we would greatly appreciate you hitting that subscribe button and commenting with who your Mike Shore fan cast would be. Believe me, it is a lot harder than you think. Yeah. Um, let us know what your thoughts on our casts and pitches were, on which director you might want to see next, on which showrunner you might want to see next, and your thoughts on all of the 10,000 shows we have talked about, whether they were produced by Mike Shore or not. Well, let's uh, tell your Mama Mia thoughts, too. Yeah, yeah, please. Your ABBA thoughts are always welcome, as long as they're positive. If they're negative, as long as they're positive. You are getting blocked if they're negative. Sorry, um, we don't make the <laughs> rules. No, ABBA does. And if you change your mind, you're last in line. Another ABBA reference. I want to thank Matt Hart and Maddie Gunner for the fantastic theme music they created for us. And I certainly want to thank you, Jack, for being our return guest today. I hope you had fun. The most fun. This is <laughs> another excellent episode. Uh, I actually don't think I've told Dan this, but I have uh, done a little bit more work on uh, last episode's music. Oh, uh, and I have completed the lyrics for uh, a song from that uh that i will play and send to dan when i get access to a keyboard clenching my fist my face the excitement on my face is palpable where where can our outside of you know tickling the ivories with awesome fantastic four uh fan music where where can our listeners find you you can find my letterbox at jma658 that's pretty much the only social media i have I redownloaded Twitter for a class, but uh, I do not use it. So Probably you're not going to be able to find me there much. So yeah, Letterboxd, if you want to find my opinions on movies that I see in theaters or at home. Um, yeah, if you want to know his Abba thoughts, his Mamma Mia thoughts, his cats. Like they're, his... they're there. Oh, they're all there. Well, anyway, <laughs> that, is, that is our show. Thank you all for listening. I'm your host, Dan Bettenhausen. On behalf of my guest, Jack Mayer, I hope you all have a fantastic day.